Today's video is sponsored by Forever Pick, exotic wood guitar picks. Handmade one at a time in Chicago, Illinois, you can choose from a selection of exotic woods that will actually improve your guitar's tone. Take advantage of an exclusive 25% off coupon when you buy the full six pack at the link in the description. And remember, when you support my sponsors, you support this channel, and I sure appreciate it. Hey y'all, it's Shed Post Friday. Hello, fillies and fellers. Brad the Guitar is here, and it's time for Shit Post Friday. Okay, first up this Shit Post Friday, a little bit of a pussy melter update. Um, last time I did a Shit Post Friday, which was a couple weeks back, I put out a call for any of you guys who want to see a uh, demonstration of a pussy melter pedal uh, on this channel uh, to contribute to my PayPal. Um, which I leave in the description of all my videos. The Pussy Melter is almost fully 100% funded. Uh, I've actually got about, I think, 30 or $40 to go until we're actually funded on the, the Pussy Melter. So good news, good news. I thought what I might do is uh, give away this Pussy Melter. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this into a raffle. So any of you guys who have already contributed uh, to the Pussy Melter Fund, um, I'm going to consider your contribution as a uh, raffle ticket. For this part of film, I use my kung fu voice to explain that for every $5 you contribute to Pussy Melter Fund, you get one raffle ticket. One only raffle ticket for every $5 you put into Pussy Melter Fund. So yeah, exciting. Invest in a Pussy Melter, because in like 10 years, these things are going to be worth, I don't know, half a million dollars probably a piece. Hey, I want to give a shout out to my good buddy, uh, Jacob Harper, who lives over in Boonville, Indiana. I lived in Evansville, Indiana for about 10 or 11 years, and uh, I met Jacob. Uh, he is a excellent luthier uh, from down around that area. He has actually sold several guitars to famous people. He's had one of one of his guitars on Saturday Night Live whenever Cage the Elephant played uh, Saturday Night Live. Um, so he's had some great successes, and uh, he just sold uh, his first guitar to Alex Lifeson of Rush, which, you know. How would you like to build a guitar for one of your heroes? And of course, I jumped at that. If you know your music legends, you've probably heard of the band Rush. They have a spot in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And now guitarist Alex Lifeson has a spot for one Harper masterpiece. Hey, Jacob, thank you so much. This guitar is mind-blowing. In a grainy Facebook video, Lifeson gives the Harper a test drive. I'm speechless. I can't believe how beautiful it is. Which swells Jacob with pride. Very cool. I, I don't think I'll ever get over it. The fact that I'm building for some of my heroes. Attention to detail is unmatched. There were certain moments where I'd see his name on the guitar and, oh, wow. Lifeson isn't the only name on top. It's weird, right? <laughs> Congratulations, Jacob. Um, couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Also in this week's news, uh, this says that a Gibson Guitar is officially interviewing for a new, for a new CEO. They tracked down this uh, uh, this job post from Exec Thread uh, around the 1st of August uh, that is located in Nashville. It's looking for a CEO slash president in Nashville. Uh, and they actually, they said, you know, music experience, preferable, this sort of thing. And they followed up with it. And apparently, yes, indeed, this is, um, this is an actual uh, call for uh, applicants to become the next CEO of Gibson. So if you guys have any CEO <laughs> level of expertise, uh, you might might want to apply. You could be the successor to uh, King Henry Jeskowitz. Hey Andy, Andy Sir, we're here. I want to ask you who your favorite guitarist is, who your favorite, and it could be a Fender guitarist, of course, but don't tell me you love all of them. I mean, if you have to give me three, that's fine, but don't tell me you love all your children equally, okay? <laughs> No, I mean one of my, one of my uh, favorite. Cars, I'm a I'm a heavy metal fan. Uh, nice. So Jim Root from Slipknot uh, um, is a band I'm a very big fan. Um, but also Tom Morello uh, is a very successful, very innovative guitarist. Wait, what was um, that? I'm sorry, what was that? Tom Morello, you Tom fucking Morello idiot. From originally Rage Against the Machine, now Prophets of Rage, very very talented, highly innovative guitarist. Anyone else? What about some more classic? Uh, types. Somebody when I would I, know. When I was, uh, <laughs> what a fucking lame ass. Was, uh, Richie Blackmore from Deep Purple and 
uh, Hendrix would be on that list, uh, I think, as he would be on most people's list. I think, you know, in terms of uh, contemporary guitarists, probably somebody like Johnny Marr uh, would also be on the list. Wow, so am I lame for liking Eric Clapton? I kind of thought that's who <laughs> we would... <laughs> Oh, my God. You stupid, you vacuous twits. You're interviewing the CEO of Fender, and you ask him, who are your two or three favorite guitarists? And he actually throws out two or three favorite guitarists. And you twits just sit there and go, am I dumb for liking Eric Clapton? Can't you pick someone a little older that I might know that our producer might have mentioned like right before the segment? Fucking idiots. This article caught my attention also from Yahoo Finance. It's entitled, uh, uh, the American guitar industry is making a serious comeback. Um, and it's, you know, the standard, uh, despite a lot of bad PR in recent years, manufacturers and sellers say demand is strong, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting read. You might want to check this out. They do offer a couple of uh, uh, different graphs, though, which kind of points to the guitar maybe hasn't really recovered fully, you know, from its heights in... Uh, you know, 2000, like, 4 through 6 or 7. Actually, it looks like 4 through 6. Interestingly, if you look at the graphs that are accompanied with this article, it appears to me that the um, guitar market is a very good predictor of the overall market because uh, the guitar market reached its height, it looks like, around 2004, 2005, okay? And then 2006, it was down. So the highest it's ever been, 2004, 2005, you know, before the crash, and then it goes down in 2006, still before the crash. So it's possible that, you know, the next time you want to know, there's a fly on the lens, the next time you want to know if the economy is going to be going up or going down in the next year or two, uh, you might take a look at the guitar market uh, as your canary in the coal mine because it's it looks to me, just looking back over this data, that the way they have it presented here, it looks to me like it goes down in 2006, and I, I wasn't aware of that. I, I thought it coincided with the 2007-2008 crash, but that doesn't appear to really be the case. It was already headed down. Um, also, interestingly, um, the number of units sold has have not reached uh, its previous heights of the 2000. 2005 years um, it looks like you know they were up over three three million uh, units in electric guitars and about they were up over a million and a half units in acoustic guitars at that time uh, and it looks like they've they're approaching these highs again with acoustics um, but not with electrics electrics are still way off they're they're um, just above two and a half million units sold in 2000. 17 so still still about 750,000 or so units uh, down from the highs of 2004-2005 uh, they have gained in in revenue um, overall according to this chart as you can see 2017 has gone up but you know much of these increases could be easily attributed to uh, inflation especially since uh, especially since 2004, 2005, because here in the U.S. we've had several rounds of quantitative easing, as you all are probably aware. So, um, you know, that's uh, most of that is probably inflation, I would guess, particularly since they haven't, they're, they're nowhere near still um, the heights and units sold. So, yes, while, you know, it's true that right now they're doing well, uh, this could easily change, and um, I read another interesting article about uh, uh, about the downfall of uh, Jeffrey the Giraffe, Toys R Us, um, and that article was interesting because they were talking about uh, how the the you know they could have survived had they been allowed to survive, but the hedge funds uh, that basically owned all of their debt ascertained that they were worth more dead than alive so they just let them die um, 30,000 something odd people put out of a job you know uh, 
but you know, I, I guess that's the way it is. You know, you're on shaky ground. You've sold out to the sharks, and and you know, I, I'm <laughs> I'm just thinking that this is probably what's going to end up happening. The ultimate fate of Guitar Center is going to be very similar to what you have seen uh, with Toys R Us, particularly since the same people own the debt uh, on GC that own the debt on Toys R Us. Many of the same creditors, so you know, take that for what it's worth. You know, the overall problem, the way I see it with the guitar market is is this. Uh, it, it only really takes one bad year. When you're already on the ropes as a business, you know, whether you're Gibson, uh, whether you are Guitar Center, uh, or whether you're even Fender, you know, I mean, we still haven't figured out what's going to happen with the raids over in the UK, whether they're going to be fined. Uh, you, and, and with those raids and with those charges that they're potentially facing, they could be fined up to 10%. Or something like something stupid like that of their worldwide revenue, so that that could be huge. Um, they did not want to, you know, give me a quote on this when this was a story a few weeks back or you know a couple months back, uh, which is another interesting thing. They open these cases. There's three different cases against, uh, or excuse me, I think five different cases, something like that, four or five, against uh, different firms, and Fender was one of them. And uh, they still haven't gone anywhere with these. They opened them like in April, uh, according to their website. They're still investigating, but they've done nothing. They've done no updating to any of these um, investigations. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It could be either, I suppose. But, you know, it only really takes one bad year, man. If you're already on the ropes, if you're already way in debt, and you have a bad year of sales, um, you know, that could be the death knell for you. And it's just, you just got to be very careful not to not to ever get in that position and if you do find yourself in that position uh, do your best to get out of it as quickly as possible where if you have to sell off things start selling off some things and get out of the debt so that to, so that you're not beholden to uh, the sharks because they will eat you alive on a lighter note I thought this was kind of interesting this guy has made uh, a guitar yeah and you guys know how I am with like recycling and like you know I'll repurpose things. Uh, I'll take old hardware off of, I'll strip old hardware off of stuff and save the old hardware. You, you guys know how frugal I am. Well, this guy, he actually uh, has made a guitar out of plastic. Like, I guess plastic that he's found on beaches or whatever. Let's see. Uh, no, excuse me, it's uh, plastic milk bottles. So... He melts down these plastic milk bottles into a block and then he cuts it and shapes it into a guitar. And it's interesting, uh, there is a company also uh, that's from that's located over in Evansville, Indiana, where I was where I lived for a long time. Uh, they're called Green Tree Plastics. There's actually a couple different plastics plants over in Evansville, and what they do is they go around to these plastics plants and all of the the scrap that they sweep up off the floor and all the off-cut bits and all this stuff, um, they put them into containers for these guys and they just go around and pick it up for free. And it actually prevents uh, this these companies from having to throw it away because they would just have to get rid of it anyway. And there's more than they can possibly even handle. So And after it's been through the molding machines, it's useless to them um, as a product. So... They give it to this company called, called Green Tree, and they they mold the you know all the park benches that you see that are made of plastic um, everywhere, and the picnic tables that you see in like municipal lawns and parks and things like this. Well, th this company makes those, and they've apparently done a really good job at it. I wonder if they could make guitar bodies. That would be interesting out of plastic, and I kind of wonder what a plastic guitar body would sound like. You know, we, we all we all know that plastic is not really the best. Uh, conductor of acoustic energy. I mean, a plastic kills acoustic energy pretty rapidly. Uh, just something about the polymers um, don't really transfer uh, the sound like like you know, nice piece of wood does. So I th I would have to believe that the sustain on a guitar like this is going to be pretty atrocious. Uh, I could be wrong. Maybe if you compacted them dense enough, you could get something resembling. Uh, the density and of and consistency of wood, possibly. I don't know. Um, I'm not a plastics expert. Don't never claim to be, but uh, I do not believe that something like this is going to um, 
uh, is going to make people forego wood anytime in the near future. But it's still interesting. You know, I admire anybody who's doing something different, especially if they're trying to recycle uh, something uh, like plastic. Because so many different types of plastics are just not recyclable or not recycled at all. And, you know, as everybody knows now, I'm sure they're ending up in the oceans. They're being shipped over to third world countries and children are playing on mountains of the shit and, and rummaging through it to find their, you know, an, enough, uh, enough so they can make their little trinkets to sell in the markets, you know, to Western tourists and just, just crazy shit like this. And they're all getting cancer. And you've got people over in China who are taking you know, clumps of old uh, e-waste and they're just putting it on open fire pits and just burning the shit and it's just going up as black smoke and the little tiny bits of silver or gold come out, you know, and they, they accumulate and save that stuff. But then you got all this shit in the sky. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm no... I'm, I'm probably right of center, you know, on my political leanings. Um, and, you know, I don't... I think I think the scaremongering uh, as far as global warming and stuff. I think there's a lot of that going on, and I think I, I abhor over taxation. Um, you know, so that that's where I generally lie. But at the same time, I, I also despise pollution. I despise waste. I despise what we're doing to the planet. You know, uh, I worry about what kind of world we're going to leave to our kids. So that is a concern. Um, and just, you know, just the way that we're treating plastics, you know, the way that this, all this shit's ending up in the Pacific Ocean, just swirling around out there. And God knows, you know, God knows what it's doing to the animals, the fish, you know, the little microscopic bits that are getting into all of our food and then subsequently into us, you know. Um, you know, this kind of shit is just, we're just running a big guinea pig farm right now on ourselves. And uh, with all of the... You know, with all the shit that Monsanto is actually um, putting into the DNA of certain plants so it has pesticides built into the plants. You know, we don't know what's happening to us when that shit gets filtered into our food supply. You know, it's just crazy shit like this that we're doing to ourselves. Um, you know, and I mentioned Al the Alex Jones thing. Uh, I guess it was a couple weeks ago when I did my last shit post Friday. You know, and said that Alex Jones is somebody whose voice... You know, we kind of need around because he's that extreme over here. We need somebody who is who's yelling about this kind of stuff, really. You know, who's saying, "Hey, look at this craziness." You know, we need somebody who's yelling about this stuff. Um, you know, there's all there's all kinds of people who are just as crazy on on the left who are yelling about the same sorts of things that he yells about half the time too. So it's not it's not just him. Um, but, you know, on, on things like this, on environmental issues and, uh, you know, what we're doing to the world and, uh, you know, yeah, definitely. I'm, that, that's, that kind of stuff does definitely worry me. And when you've got a guy like this who's making, uh, trying to make some kind of dent or trying to show, hey, you know, maybe we could do other things with this material or the guys at Green Tree Plastics who make the park benches and try to keep as much of that out of the landfill and out of the rivers and everything as they can. Um, they can't do it all, but, you know. I think ultimately we're going to have to do something about single-use plastics. You know, I again, you know, I lean way libertarian. Uh, I'm right of center on political things, um, but I do believe you know uh, some regulation is is necessary. That's why we have you know we have governments uh, for that reason. I like to see them as small as humanly possible. Um, you know, I don't want them in our economy. I don't you know I don't necessarily want all that stuff. Um, but the single use plastics are definitely a big issue and it's something we're going to have to, we're going to have to put our minds together about and come up with a, a solution as a species. You know, this is a big problem that we need our best and brightest people to really be on. Um, you know, that I would even put that, this above like the whole fossil fuels thing, because we just don't know how the plastics being in everything, in our soils, in our water and our food supply when those break down to the molecular level we just don't know what this is doing to us we don't know what it's doing to animals fish um, other forms of wildlife you know so i would say that 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 is probably going to be the biggest problem uh, of our times that uh, you know it's it's going to take very bright people to solve it's also going to take uh, some people with a lot of interest and not seeing that come to fruition 
to get the fuck out of the way, you know. And and some of those people are in government. Some of those people also are in big business, but some of them are also in government, aiding and abetting those people in big business. That's the real danger. When you get both together and you get this corporatist model that we have now, you know, we're you're pretty much fucked when that happens. You you've got to if you're gonna have regulators, you can't have the fox watching the hen house. You know, that's what I'm saying. And as far as bottles, you know, as far as single-use plastic bottles, I'm sorry to get off on a real tangent. If you guys don't like hearing this shit, then let me know down in the comments. But, you know, as far as single-use plastic bottles, we already have the solution to that problem. We've had that solution for, you know, for millennia. And that is ceramics and glass, <laughs> you know. Why do we not package more of our things in ceramics and glass? Uh, because... When you break one of those or you discard one of those, it just becomes fucking sand, you know, which hurts nobody. <laughs> so, you know, you might cut your foot on it, but it's not going to get in your food supply. You're not going to be eating the glass. You know what I mean? So um, I would much prefer to go back to glass anyway, because fuck, soda pop used to taste so much better when it was packaged in glass. I mean, you, could, you, get, a, you get a soda pop, a cold soda pop now... And I say soda pop. I could be saying Coke or Pepsi or something. Whatever. Whatever you want to call it. I know everybody has regional differences. <laughs> Don't start making fun of me because I call it fucking soda pop. That's something my uh, grandma... Uh, something my grandma instilled in me. Soda pop. <laughs> That's what she always said. Anyway, soda pop. If you go to get one out of the you know the cooler in, a, in your convenience store or something and you take a drink of it, it just it doesn't taste right. It tastes like shit. You know, I remember, I remember going to uh, like the tractor supply store because we. I lived in a rural area. I grew up on a farm. I remember going to like the tractor supply store um, in Fredonia, Kentucky, with my dad, and we would go in there. They had this. They had a cooler and stuff, and um, you'd go in there sometimes to get drinks. Uh, I might be actually misremembering this, but anyway, I think they did. Uh, but you go in there and get drinks, and you take a, you take that first drink of like a knee high grape soda in a in a bottle. You know, when I was a little kid, and man, it's like it's like a taste of heaven. Not only did they screw with the formula of the actual drink, you know, packaging it in in the um, glass made a huge difference. And these plastic bottles just don't cut it. After about the second little um, sip, I, I can't even hardly drink a, a soda anymore. It's just it tastes awful to me. So anyway, so there's that. There's my take on soda pop <laughs> as if you asked for that and to round out the news this week I thought I would show uh, this crazy Chinese chick um, as if playing the guitar wasn't fun enough she has to go up and paraglide and play guitar at the same time I think this is kind of like the guitar equivalent of like inviting a third wheel into your marriage bedchamber <laughs> You know, it's like things are things are kind of dull now, honey. We need to we need to invite we need to get something else going. You know, we need to get in a swingers club or something. Let's go do it while we paraglide <laughs> high above the tourist destinations. She actually wasn't playing half bad. It's gonna be hard. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this or not. You're definitely not going to be able to hear it. Actually, did I say she wasn't playing half bad? She sounds like shit. You're not missing anything. I would also have to believe that that kind of altitude in the open air is going to play havoc on your intonation and your tuning. Okay, so that's all for the news. Also, on the last ship post Friday, um, I showed you guys some of the vinyl records that I had gotten. Uh, this was one of them, this Van Morrison live album. This album is fan-fucking-tastic. You guys have got to get this. This is a killer album. It's just, it's just pure freaking soul, man. I sat here and played. Um, I played guitar along with this entire album the other night, and just like twice through, um, just zoning, zoning out, getting way into the soul 
uh, Motown kind of feel. It was incredible. Felt like I was part of the band. Also, this Jackson Brown uh, was really good too. Uh, it's just, this has got some good stuff on it. Whoever said that uh, um, this was his best album, you may be right about that. I don't know. I haven't heard all of his albums, but this is a good one. Sounded good to me anyway. Uh, and also, the other one that stood out to me that I listened to out of that batch of albums that I got was this one. This Mott the Hoople album is incredible. This is a great album. Uh, my impressions of it were that it was kind of show tuney, you know, kind of rock opera, sort of like it remind a lot of parts in it reminded me, especially on si um, side one, reminded me of. Uh, Oh God! What's that movie with Tim Curry? Fucking, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Transsexuals from Transylvania. <laughs> God, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, a lot of it reminded me of Rocky Horror Picture Show. It just kind of had that whole show tune kind of vibe to it a little bit. Um, and I haven't read all of the lyrics yet, so I don't know. There's probably this is probably a a concept album or something. I just didn't. I just didn't understand that or something for when I listened. I've only listened to it one one time through. Uh, my favorite tracks on this though were Trudy's song, um, Pearl and Roy, which had great horns and and uh, groove. The, basically, the entire second side of this album is absolutely incredible. Or maybe I was just self-medicated. <laughs> I might listen to it today and it'd just be like, what the hell? This is not the same record. <laughs> um, also found a couple other albums the other day. I was, I was going through some bins at uh, a couple of little local stores. And they, these were cheap. Uh, got this Heart album. This is Bad Animals from 1987. This is the first, this is the first uh, cassette tape. Uh, that I remember ever buying for myself. Now, that, I think there was one before this, and I think it was Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet. It was either Slippery When Wet or it was this one, but I do distinctly remember buying this one. My mom took me to Walmart one day, and I, I guess I had money from mowing the lawn or something because that was the only way I could have gotten uh, money at the time. But do you remember like when uh, everything was on tape and the tapes had those uh, anti-theft things that were like this freaking long and it was made of plastic. And, you know, as if, what's, it's kind of funny because nobody would even dream of stealing a tape today, you know. It's just like, what's the point of trying to steal a tape? Um, people usually give them away. But the, the, but the anti-theft thing was like this freaking long. And, and speaking of plastic, it was just all white plastic. You know, it was cut out, so it didn't. You know, it didn't have a whole lot of plastic there, really. You probably melt it down; it would be a really tiny ball. But I'm sure that shit added up, you know, because I mean, they had thousands upon thousands of tapes, and every single one of them had this giant ass plastic anti-theft thing that you would. They would take it. Oh, well, this pissed me off too. I just had a recollection about buying cassette tapes. When, you remember when they you would take it to the front, or like Walmart or wherever you were, wherever you were buying your tapes? You'd take it to the front and you'd hand it to the cashier and they would have this big giant anti-theft thing. So they would get these scissors out and they would they would stick it under the edge of the anti-theft thing and they would, they would chop it with scissors. And the back of the scissors would always crack the jewel case on the fucking cassette before you even got it home, you know? So there was always this little this little ding or crack right on the jewel cassette. Pissed me off every time. I'm like, man, you guys figure out a better way to do this because I'm sick of you cracking my fucking jewel cases. <laughs> oh, man. I was anal uh, with my cassettes even as a little kid. I guess, what, 1987, I would have been uh, nine or ten, nine years old, nine years old, ten years old. Um, but yeah, that also reminds me of that uh, Slippery slippery When Wet album. Um, I guess that one came out in 86, so I probably did buy Slippery When Wet first. Um, the other album that was kicking around in my house at that time was, uh, was Europe's The Final Countdown. I, and I didn't buy that. I don't know how that got there. I think that was my uncle. Because this was the time when my mom uh, was divorced from my dad and... There were three of us kids and my mom and uh, her brother 
who I think was also recently divorced at the time, uh, was living back with uh, their mother, my grandmother. And also my great-grandfather lived there too. He was still alive. So there was a bunch of people crammed in this one house. Uh, but we had one room that I shared with my sisters. And, uh, you know, the things I remember, like 80, 1986 toys, like I remember there being Garbage Pail Kids stickers like on the door and on the, you know, on the toy box. You remember Garbage Pail Kids cards and stickers, you know, you could peel the sticker off. It was like, you know, like they were all picking their nose or doing something gross or puking or whatever. Uh, but yeah, that, that was the that was that whole time period. And I remember the first thing I, when I listened to that Bon Jovi Slippery When Wet tape, it's funny because uh, I think I bought that on the strength of uh, the You Give Love a Bad Name single because that was, I think, the first single they came out with on that album. And then I listened to the whole tape through and I was like, man, this this other song on here is is twice as good as that and it was Living on a Prayer. And I would listen to that song over and over and over again before it was even on the radio. And... Uh, for whatever reason, I hated, um, what was the other one on that? Um, Wanted Dead or Alive. Yeah, for some, I didn't hate that song, but it wasn't one of my favorites on that album. Um, anyway, just brought back memories. Talking shit out of my ass. Oh, and I also, yeah, Rat, Out of the Cellar. So I picked this one up. Um, you guys, the, uh, Rat was one of my... Uh, I think they were the first influence that I mentioned, and and in my influences segment, um, I think I think more I'm kind of choosing uh, the influences that I have stories with, you know, from my from my childhood, because it, it makes more interesting talk if I'm talking about uh, the influences that really are kind of deep down in there, you know, um, that were some of the first ones. And Rat was definitely, uh, they were kind of there in the beginning of the whole rock and roll thing. Um, and speaking of rock and roll, I did, um, when I did my influences segment on Boston a while back, I talked about my uncle who took me around in his uh, a muscle car and introduced me to Boston. Well, um, he, just, he just passed away of cancer um, last month, my uncle Ricky. Uh, Ricky Jepson was his name. So, um, Uncle Ricky, I love you. I'm gonna miss you until we meet again. And then the the I found these for two dollars a piece. This is Fats Domino Live. And for two bucks, there's no way I was gonna leave that behind. The the uh, vinyl was in pretty good shape too. Also got this Ventures record. I did not have. I think I mentioned, I, I've, you guys have probably seen a lot of my Ventures records that I do own, and it's a lot of them, but I don't have some of their earlier ones, and uh, this is one of their earlier ones, and it has uh, that version of House of the Rising Sun on it that's on the Greatest Hits album. So, if you guys don't mind, also, if you haven't already subscribed to my second channel, Guitologist Channel 2, uh, please go over there and hit the subscribe button uh, so that you'll get notifications when I start posting more over there. I just reached the threshold that you have to reach to get uh, considered for monetization. Now, I don't know if they're going to allow me to have monetization on that yet or not. Um, they might just look at me and say, we don't want this SOB to have any monetization anymore, um, which I wouldn't put it past them. But... Uh, you know, if you don't mind, go over there and subscribe to that because I, if they do monetize me over on that channel, I'm definitely going to dump more stuff over onto that because I, you know, I get kind of ideas here and there of, of things uh, that I can film or whatever that really wouldn't fit on this channel um, that a lot of you guys wouldn't give a damn about anyway. Uh, so, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather just have the creativity, the, uh, the freedom to go ahead and film that stuff if I get an idea and throw it over there. Um, so, you know, the people who do want to see it can see it, and it's kind of more of an outlet for me, too. It kind of keeps me a, um, keeps me doing something. It keeps me doing different things, because if I do too much of the same thing, you know, there's only so many times you can 
uh, you can open up an amplifier and change all the caps, you know, that until it, before it just starts to really bore the fuck out of you. So, um, you know, I need to do different things. I need to probably get some more guitars out and uh, uh, service some guitars. I've actually got some other stuff that I've gotten recently, uh, like this thing. This is another little score from a local shop, a um, little local antique shop. This is a mountain dulcimer. If you don't know what a mountain dulcimer is, it's a uh, it's an instrument that has usually three or four strings. This one is supposed to have, it's interesting because it, it's cut, the nut and the saddle are cut for four string, but they've only got three tuners here. So I mean, I'm gonna take these tuners off and do something different up here anyway probably drill a fourth hole so that I can make it a four stringer because you really need that fourth string to get the chorusy effect. Um, but yeah, there's a missing peg down here, so I'm going to do something to uh, um, to anchor the strings, put new strings on it. Um, might play some dulcimer tunes for you. I like the carving on that headstock. That is pretty cool. I don't know what the hell it's supposed to be. I see the musical note, but is that supposed to be like a dragon's foot or, or something, maybe? Like a dragon's claw? I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I'll probably make a video of this. I'll put some strings on this, um, fix the little flaws, drill, a, drill another hole, put some strings on, and that might be a good subject for a Channel 2 video. Okay, so that concludes this edition of Shitpost Friday. Hope you guys have enjoyed this one. Hit subscribe down below if you have. Also hit the bell to receive all notifications. And for now, y'all take care.